knew very well the old conundrums, such as the famous riddle of the Sphinx, sold by Oedipus, or the less famous riddle asked by some fishermen that caused the death of Homer at the beach of Ayas. As far as we know, there existed some collections of Greek riddles assembled since the Hellenistic age, although they have not come down to us. The peripatetic philosopher Clearchus of Soli wrote a book whose title was Peri Aigmaton on Rhythms. Some fragments have been saved by Athenaeus together with an interesting small collection of riddles, mostly taken from ancient and medieval comedy. Another important collection is the 14 books of the Palatine Ecology, Manga problems, oracles, and riddles. Difficult today, but older than the beginning of the 10th century, when the school teacher Constantine Cephalas, BK according to Alan Cameron, put together his Zamlung of epigrams witnessed by the famous manuscript now kept half in Heidelberg and half in Paris. Then, Chefas intended the peculiar collection assembled in this book as a teaching instrument is proved by the short foreword written by the same Constantine before the first epigram of the book. You can read here. Gymnasia karin kai tauta kai tois philoponois protitemi in agnosti men palaion pailes fideneo. By stating that his collection was aimed at the students who loved to labor so that they might know what their predecessor had to study, the Byzantine scholar underlined the didactic goals of his editorial work. When the content of uh, Cephal's anthology began to spread in Constantinople, the genre of the riddle became popular. Some of the poets who started to compose riddles are well-known authors such as John the Geometer, Christopher Mitilini, Michael Pselius, John Eugenius, while others are more difficult to identify and to date, such as Basil Megalonidis and Eustace Macrambolitis. Which are the different categories of these enigmatic compositions? Besides the riddles proper, we have some conundrums based on different kinds of wordplay. The subjects may vary, and among the solutions, we find mythical and literary figures, together with other figures taken by the scriptures. Here is a brief overview of the main categories of the riddles. I start from three mythological riddles, all present in the Palatine anthology. Uh, 
The translation of this riddle, the ninth of the 14th book, is my father is law, in law killed my husband. My husband killed my father in law. My brother in law killed my father. My father in law killed my father. Uh, the solution of this quite complicated genealogical riddle, this is its speaking character, is a figure that has the same name of the colleague that is going to speak after me, that is Andromache, daughter of Aetion, who had two husbands, Hector, Priam's son, and Neoptolemus, Achilles' son. The two play tells in an extremely synthetical way Andromache's life. Achilles, her second father-in-law, was the murderer of her first husband, Hector. Neoptolemus, her second husband, was the murderer of her first father-in-law, Brian. Paris, her brother-in-law, he was the brother of her first husband, Hector, was the murderer of her second father-in-law, Achilles, who, in his turn, had murdered her father, Eating. The riddle can be found in other manuscripts as well. We read it, for instance, in a bulky 12th century millennials book, the Parisian Supplementi Greci, 690, followed by a long and detailed explanation that gives us a solution by identifying all the relatives of poor Andromache. The riddle number three is, having been killed, I killed my killer. He did not go to Hades, though, but I died. The figure in question are Heracles and Nessus. The centaur Nessus, killed by Heracles, killed his killer by poisoning him with his own blood. Although we cannot tell who wrote this in the giant couplet, we happen to know the source of this idea. In the last part of Sophocles, Women of Phratis, the dying hero Heracles remembers the prophecy that his father Zeus had given him. It was prophesied to me by my father long ago that I would never die at the hands of anyone who breathed, but at the hands of the one who was dead and lived in Hades. So this monster, the centaur, as the divine prophecy had foretold me, killed me, I being alive and he being dead. The same play on to kill and uh, to be killed is in the fourth example. I killed my brother and my brother killed me. Our death was caused by our father. Because of our reciprocal death, we killed our mother. The speaking character who defies the reader of this couple is either Etiocles or Polynices. Ilicus and Jocasta's son, who killed each other in front of the gates of Thebes. Their death, death had been foretold by their father Ilicus, who had cursed them. In Euripides' Phoenician women, their mother kills herself after having seen the reciprocal death. In my opinion, the content of these three riddles shows that their purpose was to test the knowledge of ancient mythology the young students had. The same remarks, remarks might be made for those riddles that add to these questions some place and word with the goal of widening the student's vocabulary. The first example does not come from the Palatine mythology, but from a manuscript now in Venice that has preserved a small collection of riddles. I translate. The riddle built in a very learned way, has as its solutions two bisyllabic words. Each word has five letters, and two of these letters have the same name. The meter of the first word comes from the pyrrhic. The meter of the second one comes from the trochi. Think about it quickly. The first word is a blowing wind. The trochi is a part of the body. If you take away the first letter from the second word, you will find a brave soldier of Homer. The first two solutions of this clever riddle, written in a 14th century manuscript, 
presented by Cardinal Tessarion to the Marshall Library of Venice, are two words of five letters, both of two syllables, in each of which there are two letters that have the same name. The only difference is the length of their first syllable. The first solution, the period, has two short syllables, while the second solution, the trope, has one long and one short syllable. The first one is a wind, the second is a part of our human body. So these are the clues that the poem gives us. And my solution is the following. The first one is notos, a wind with two omicons. The second one is notos, that means back, so part of the human body. If you take away the first letter of notos, you have otos, who is an Achaean warrior, leader of the Greek herd of Achaeans, killed by the Trojan Polygamas in the 15th book of Iliad. So, useful both for studying the Homeric points, even though the figure is not very conspicuous, and for teaching the basic principles of classical meter, although the riddle is written in a meter, the logic syllable, that did not take into account the quantity of syllables. But this ingenious point betrays clearly its didactic origin. Now let's go back to the Palatine topology. The name uh, in the jargon of the brain teaser scans, the name of this kind of conundrum is wedge. If we insert, like a wedge, the letter that indicates the number 100 in the middle of the word fire, because this is the meaning of the riddle I translated for you, if you put 100 in the middle of the burning fire, you will find out the son and the killer of a virgin. So, the word fire is written exactly at the beginning of the reader, it's pyros. And if you insert the letter that indicates the number 100, that is rho, you have pyros. And you know, the pyros was the uh, son of Achilles in Daidamia, the daughter of Lycomedes, called Virgin because Achilles was her first man. And uh, Neoptolemus was the killer of uh, Polyxena, the virgin daughter of uh, Bran. This way is a good introduction to other kinds of more complicated wordplays, much beloved by the Byzantine poets. So, I am a part of the human body, a part that I can cut. If you take away one letter, the sun sets. So, this was a quite uh, popular riddle, so we can find the solution between the margins of some manuscript. And the solution is onyx and nux, because uh, we can cut our nails, and when uh, uh, night comes, of course, the sun sets. Uh, this kind of wordplay can present many variations. One is the elimination of the first letter and the last letter of a, a word, as in the following reading. I'm one of the parts of the human body, but I also act as a production during battles. If you want, you can find out that I have a double meaning. I bring inside me a word made of two syllables, four on the whole by five letters. Their number reaches the sum of 1,000, but only if you have added the number 30 to this total sum. If you take away the beginning and end of the letters that compose my name, and if you look at what is left, I indicate time and beauty. In fact, I still have another example me. Also, this riddle is very clever. Here we find another clue that is meant to help the reader in finding solution, of, or better, in proving that the solution is correct. If we sum up the numeric values of the letter of the longer solution according to the principle of isoxophy, the result is the number 970, that is 1,000 minus 30. 
which is then the word that means something that was used as a protection during battles and at the same time is the part of the human body. Well, think of this part of the body. It's thorax. And uh, uh, thorax is also coolant in, in the grid, so something that is used to protect the body in the battle. And uh, if you're not convinced, well, just add 9, the unit value of theta, 800 omega, 100 rho, 1 alpha, and 60. See, and if you are a fairly good mathematician, you find out that the result is exactly 970. If you are still not persuaded, take away the first and the last letter of thoughts. What you have the word aura that indicate not only time, the power, but also the physical appearance. You. Together with this elimination of the first letter, we might add also another word like the triangle. I belong among the group of virtuous men, an unusual champion of the ascetic life. The five letters of my name produce the following number with their two syllables. A quarter of once and a hundred four times. That is 404. Deprived of the first of those letters, friend, my name is still bountiful. Listen now and learn something as strange and significant. If you speak in reverse from hand to start the letters of my original name, my name does not change at all. The solution of this conundrum, copied in a manuscript that is a real gold mine for the diggers of Byzantine rituals, uh, Monet to Museum of 1947, is the name Sabas, a Byzantine monk whose name did not change if read backwards. Deprived of the first letter, it becomes Abbas, ever. A Latin word that came from the Aramaic Abba through the Greek Abbas, a figure that might be called one. <laughs> that this is the right solution is proved by the sum of the numeric value of the five letters. Sigma is 200, alpha is 1, and beta is 2. And even the sum 44 is 100, by the way. This riddle has a peculiar solution we do not find in a classical conundrum. Sabas is not a mythological hero, but the same. He therefore introduces in the world of our riddles a different kind of mythology, where the protagonists are figures connected to Christian religions. There are many examples of similar riddles. Here, there's a small solution, I think, that I will let just the time of mentioning one of them, and you find the other one in the, in the written version of the of the, this paper. My father begets me out of my mother's womb. I beget the mother of my sons. My sons beget the mother of my father. The solution of this biblical conundrum with a peculiar biblical flavor, written in many versions in many manuscripts, this version comes from the Temonensis Gregus 116, a manuscript copied by the Cardinal Isidore of Kiev in the 15th century, is Adam, first man. He says that his father, God, has begotten him out of the mouth of Mother Earth. Then he had in his turn begotten Eve, the mother of his sons, out of one river. Then his sons, namely his lineage, had begotten the Virgin Mary, the mother of Christ, the father of Adam. How much time do you have? Well, 10 minutes. Okay, so I will jump to Riddle 13. Uh, I am the accuser of those who repudiate their friends. I wake up men and urge them to work. If you cut my head and mow my neck, I soon become the son of a king, a strict man. He does not leave the path. Here, the Christian element is blended with the pagan one. The first solution is the word alector, altron, cock. The first line alludes to the cock that uh, sung after Peter had repudiated, repudiated Christ for the first time, while the second line portrays the common cock 
that uses to cry at sunrise. If we take away the first two letters of the first solution, that this is what the poet means by saying the head and the neck, we have the second one. The, actor, the Trojan hero who never wanted to leave the past. The most successful of these world plays is a type that we might call the progressive elimination of the first letter. This play happens when the first solution, once it is deprived of its first letter, letter of its kefale, its head, becomes a second solution, that once deprived of the first letter, becomes a third solution, and so on. Many other the Byzantine readers that follow this pattern. One of the oldest is the epigram we read in the Palatine anthology. It's 105. I am a part of an animal that affects the ground. If you take a single letter away from me, I become a part of the head. If you take away another letter, I shall again be an animal. If you take another away, you will not find me one, but two hundred. So this is, these are the solutions. Foot is the foot, so part of an animal that touches the ground. Uh, without P, we have us here, a part of the head. Without Omicron, we have us, an animal. And without Upsilon, we have sigma, which is the number of the country. Uh, one longer example of, uh, of uh, this wordplay that uh, I sure was very popular, there are about 15 examples of conundrums uh, uh, like this, uh, is this one. Uh, it's attributed to this strange figure called Basil Megalomites. And uh, here it, it's the translation I live in the sea and I'm food for the mortals. My name is five letters. If you cut the letter of my head, you will know that I'm a thing most below by the carpenters. If you take away also the second letter, you will find out that I'm one of the five senses. And if you take away the third letter as well, you will find out that I'm a strength, power, and vigor. So, what is the solution? Well, it's a, I'm not so, so machant. Uh, <laughs> think of what, what you had eaten yesterday evening as entree. What did you eat? Crevet. Yes, exactly. What is the name of crevet in Greek? That's difficult. Thank you. Greeks love uh, fish. So, Prevet was quite present in their dishes, and in fact, that's how Prevet, I don't know if in modern Greek the name is changed or in the same one. It's the same one. Hundreds, right? Caris. Uh, so if you take away the first letter, we have Aris, that is drill, so an instrument used by you know, people who work uh, wood for. for uh, for building uh, chips. And if we take away the alpha, we have Riz, no, which is part of one of the five senses. And if we take away Rho, we have Is, that means uh, strength, force, bigger. Uh, of course, this is the kind of wordplay that have, you know, uh, can have many variants. There is one variant where there is also another solution. If you take away the first letter, we have 200. So, but that's some, most of these wordplays are very uh, are similar. So uh, this solution might think that another venue for creation and use of conundrums, uh, such as the symposium. But uh, I want to end my paper with uh, another example, another two examples uh, that are uh, more apt to underline uh, the didactic goal of these uh, rhythms. Uh, this example uh, is known to us in two different forms. 
the oldest one is a fragment in iambic trimeters by Antiphanes, comic poet. It's the only extant fragment from the comedy Sappho. And we know it because of uh, Athenaeus, who quoted in the Deathness of it. There is a feminine being which keeps its babe safe beneath its bottom. Though voiceless, they raise a sonorous cry over the waves of the sea and across the dry land, reaching whomever of the mortals they desire. They can be heard even by those who are not there, but the sense of hearing they have is dull. Well, in the comedy, uh, one character uh, of the comedy uh, gives one solution, and it's this one. The being of which you speak is the state, the base she nourishes within her are the politicians. These, by their bowling, draw in the receipts across the sea from Asia and from trade. Meanwhile, the people sit near them while they feed and brawl continually, neither hearing nor seeing any. Uh, so you see, the answer, the first answer given is the crown, policy. But the answer is wrong. As Sackler said, remarks, nonsense. How could a politician be voiceless? The correct answer is given by Sappho in the, other, the end of the fragment. This feminine being is a pistolet, the letter. The babes within her are the letters it carries around. Though voiceless, they talk to whom they desire when far away. If another happened to be standing near when a letter is read, he would hear nothing. And there is also a version, a Byzantine version, by basic megalomitis, which is basically the same, uh, but the fact that it's written in a, another Byzantine meter, the, the, the uh, political verse. The idea that even a written text can speak with readers is present, present in some later Greek and Latin readers as well. When I was alive, I was completely speechless. I died just the other day, and I'm full of any kind of speechlessness. The solution of this very popular riddle attributed to Michael Sellers is parchment, the most precious writing material used in late antiquity, made of the skin of cheap hounds and goats. By playing, playing on the two meanings of logos, intellect, but also word, uh, the author lets us know that even what is written down is a kind of speech. This subject matter can be found not only in Byzantine riddles, but also in some Latin riddles that dwell on the topic of writing. Here you can see, for instance, the two riddles that open the collection of symposiums, a uh, Latin poet uh, who lived uh, around the 4th and 5th century uh, CD whose solutions are, for the first one, graphium, graphium, the stylus, and second one, harundo, the reed. But there are many similar examples in Adermus or Maltory, in Tatwini or Eusebius, other uh, English poets of the 8th and 9th century who wrote riddles in Latin. Well, what other little point than this one of Sedus, who can be found in many, really many manuscripts, basically always in the same uh, version. What other little poem might be more suitable for a young student of school in Byzance than a reader that alludes enigmatically to what actually is and is going to be his name God? Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? So, <coughs> uh, two questions. First question is Where are these riddles from the other kings? Well, nowhere it is written anything about uh, uh, the venue, the, when they were used. But the fact that uh, Constantine Kefalas uh, uh, makes a collection of these uh, plays and similar plays, because uh, 
mathematical problems are also a kind of a game because they are in their um, they, their playful side is the way they are written. So uh, and also the, the small the short introduction I just you know quoted at the beginning is one of the the thing that makes me think that this might be kind of place for young kids or young students. You see, uh, it's written uh, in agnos, in order that you might know, Timen palayon files So, uh, which, uh, which played, played the files, the young children of the old Greeks and what the children of the new Greek do. So that's one one thing. And also especially the you know the the funny, the witty way this kind of points are presented. So this might is a suggestion that might they might be uh, kind of play. And uh, uh, even if we think that some of these points uh, were used in symposia, you know, they also always have a playful way because you know that uh, it's, it was played between adults and not between kids, but also a kind of you know, and play and try you know to uh, to make fun of someone or something. Uh, the second question: Have, have some of these rules uh, been included in the, in the early medieval uh, rule collections, such as Alcuin and others? Uh, um, yes, in Alcuin there are some rules that uh, echo some of the rules of Symposius and uh, the other uh, English poets. Uh, the connection between uh, the solutions of the Greek readers and the solution of the Latin readers is not so strong. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an article written about 30 or 40 years ago that tried to put in connection some of these readers, but you know the, the thread was really very uh, thin. So it's, uh, it was not totally convincing, also because we do not have uh, uh, we don't know too much, and we know that uh, in uh, during. Uh, uh, the Middle Ages for many centuries, uh, uh, the Latin people could not uh, read or speak Greek and vice versa, apart from some uh, figures that were able to uh, read and speak both languages. They mostly were Greek, for Lamundus, for instance, who was the ambassador of the NSA. So he was able even to translate uh, uh, all the into, into Greek. Thank you so much for this event. I have this uh, uh, question before it's off. It is a little bit flash in the matter that we believe the population and possibilities and time months with many diseases. You make it off so people know the best and the future of the book or the magic book. Well, uh, it is very interesting uh, in position with you. But uh, my attitude uh, found uh, readers with uh, political meaning. For example, in the 19th century uh, market months, which you have uh, exhausted, you calculate what months the youths with the amount of added up to uh, six, uh, 666, that is the number of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So, youths uh, is that dead in this uh, this uh, the, the I, I, No, I haven't found it. No, no. No. The, the only place on, yeah, on so numbers is just on, on this opposite. That's the only yeah. So it's subject is there also for, yeah. uh, but not without uh, the inability of political. No, no. In this case, no, no. Well, uh, in, in in other fields, for instance, uh, uh, in uh, in Artemidorus, uh, yes. some things are interpreted in this uh, fun way. There is one word play that I have mentioned, but you know, the, uh, there were too many to mention. Uh, one of the most famous was the charade. So the union of two different words that put together form another, another different word. So there, there is famous uh, charade in the anthology, uh, of the article plus meros, phi, that put together makes omeros, so homer. And uh, there was a, a dream interpreted by Artemidorus 
uh, in this way, there was someone who had drank of an eagle, and uh, Artemidor's explanation was that uh, uh, dreaming an eagle, it means that something is going to happen in one ear, because eagle is aetos, and aetos can be read alpha, one, and ethos here. So, you know, there are this kind of, 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 uh, of wordplay, but not in the, the, the illusion way. Right? So, following up on, on the first question, I think it's, it's very didactic, this, this entire mythology. Uh, I wonder how, how funny it is. Really. And uh, then you said that many things are also in the symposium. Mm -hmm. And in the symposium, of course, it's, it's a different context without so much didactic purpose uh, linked to wine and much more playful. And then you also put in oracles. And oracles, of course, can be very serious. Yes. And, and very dramatic. So maybe you can. Yeah, uh, well, well, uh, well uh, what uh, is the common uh, yeah. part of all these uh, enigmatic uh, you know, uh, plays or poets is, uh, uh, is the fact that uh, you need an interpretation, mm -hmm. okay? And also the way that these uh, riddles, oracles, dreams, or whatever are structured. But the structure is always the same, and we can find, for instance, the same uh, wordplay uh, used in, in a dream, or in an oracle, or in a riddle. So, once is the linguistic uh, uh, pattern that is used. Uh, as for the venue, it's difficult to say. Uh, for instance, the, the, the wordplay on caris, not on, on the shrimp. Well, then, uh, th th this was very suitable for during the market. You know, people eating shrimp and actually asking a, a riddle on a shrimp. Uh, but also, it could be uh, used also in, uh, in, uh, in, in a class of, of students. Uh, uh, for instance, if, if we uh, consider the two riddles with uh, meter explanation, the one riddle with meter explanation, no? notos, notos, otos, uh, this was not really a, a very good uh, riddle for a bank. I mean, you are eating <laughs> and, and someone asks you about theory, trophy, and something like that. But there, are, there is a way uh, to, uh, to use meter also in a funny way. Uh, there is a reason I have quoted, which was very, actually very uh, famous, and it was, it was always, always uh, quoted in, uh, together with other two readers. And the first editor of this reader was uh, Lessing. Dr. Ephraim Lessing uh, found these three readers in a manuscript in a uh, in, uh, in Boston, where he was a uh, librarian. And this riddle is quite a huge one because it's, uh, it's eight uh, lines long. And the first four lines are, are quite bizarre and some, something that they do not belong to the other part of the riddle. But the second part of the riddle is a clear play on uh, uh, dactylic meter because it's plays with the fact that, you know, the, the dactylos is also indicated uh, finger, you know, because and finger has a, a, a long part and two small parts. And this riddle, I, uh, I, I don't have it here, but I, I will uh, truly quote in, put in, uh, in the written version of the paper. It's a nice place on the fact that uh, dactylus means finger, but uh, there are also the opposite of, uh, of uh, dactylus, uh, that is finger, uh, is kefale. What? Why is kefale the opposite of, uh, of finger? Because kefale is uh, uh, short, short, long. So, which is the contrary, the opposite of that, which is long, short, short. And then there are other parts of the body whose, uh, whose name is, uh, is, is, is a meter. Uh, for instance, anterion, which is long, short, short, long. So, this Riddle is a play of, 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 on, on the, the name of the meters and, and uh, the meters uh, themselves. So, uh, this is an example of, of, uh, of a wordplay clearly for the school. And so, a way, a way to teach a uh, meter in a funny way, if it is possible to teach meter. <laughs>
c'est-à-dire selon des champs sémantiques et des liens chroniques parmi les mots. Le critère en un instant avait été le plus important et le plus usé depuis la culture, euh, la culture la plus ancienne jusqu'à l'Alexandrie. Et seulement à l'âge de Pollux, le critère alphabétique commençait à être résolu. Euh, il y a un problème pour comprendre ça, mais ici il y a naturellement le temps de, de parler de, de, la, de la raison, parce que les critères monastiques n'ont pas plus à, à l'âge de Pollux. Cependant, c'est de Pollux et la seule œuvre composée d'un critère monastique qui est par un jusqu'à nous. En conséquence, nous devons nous rappeler égétique et érodique. Cette œuvre est née de la culture à la Saint-Denis. Alors, leur point de vue était surtout littéraire. Le travail, <rire> le travail partait des grands auteurs, des grands ouvres de la littérature. Et seulement, et seulement en moindre mesure de la, du langage parlé. L'idée de l'usage réel du langage était fondamentale à Pergam, non pas à la Sainte. Même le monastique de Polus a choqué des sources de terre. Nous n'avons pas l'indication des textes qui sont les sources de terre, même parce que notre texte de Polus n'est pas original, mais a été coupé par ceux qui l'ont utilisé dans le siècle suivant. Euh, nous l'avons déjà vu hier, que c'est un élément fondamental pour euh, les œuvres et pour l'histoire des textes érudits. L'histoire des textes érudits, les textes érudits étaient envisagés comme des outils, comme des instruments, et tous ceux qui les utilisaient pouvaient les changer. Il y a une différence notable entre la mentalité de ceux qui copiaient le texte biblique et de celle de ceux qui copiaient le texte littéraire. Les premières victimes d'équipage étaient les citations et les indications de l'État. Tout ça nous a empêché, a nous empêché de comprendre un élément fondamental. Nous savons que pour nous, est écrit qu'on devrait une polémique à propos du grec que les auteurs pouvaient utiliser. Et nous constatons que pour nous, ne partage pas les idées plus puristes, les idées de Pénicus, et qu'il y a même une polémique contre lui. Selon moi, un expert avait raison en donnant l'importance à cette polémique, malgré l'idée contraire de quel seront les contraires. Nous, mais nous ne comprenons pas bien le terme de cette politique. Parce qu'elle devait concerner surtout que les auteurs devaient être considérés par la cible et d'une tête unité. Pour Lux et Primicus étaient atticistes et pensaient que les auteurs contemporains ne pouvaient utiliser le grec que l'on utilisait en parlant, mais qu'ils devaient imiter le grec des grand auteur classique. Mais quel était le grand auteur classique À mon avis, à mon avis, le canon de Pollux était bien plus large que ceux de Primus. Et dans son monastique était registré des termes utilisés par des auteurs que Primus condamnait. Mais il n'est pas possible de préciser tout ça. Ce ne signifie pas euh, qu'il n'y a pas de jugement. Et, et le premier exemple, un exemple un peu drôle, un peu bizarre. Pourquoi Il y a un passage, un fragment de ce 
et dit que euh, nous parler de l'organisation des pagones, c'est l'organisation de compétition. Euh, Sofort, vous avez le terme à garantir, qui est un apax légal. Il y a son nom ici, à garantir. Qu'est-ce que dit Colus Colus dit que la garantie a le signifié de la garantie. La garantie, nous savons ce que ça signifie. Signifie l'organisation des de compétitions. Mais, il ajoute, Morteros, Morteros, mal. Alors, il y a un jugement, et ce jugement est étrange parce que Sofocle était un modèle pour les artistes. Et s'il y a un jugement de euh, terme il fait par Sofocle, pour, pourquoi Parce qu'il y avait été contraire, probablement, à la grammaire, à ce que euh, Pollux pensait. Pollux, Pollux, et ça chose. Mais probablement, ça chose. Et quelle était la sa chose Peut-être qu'on suit le cercle, on suit le rat. Il y avait une source grammaticale, peut-être qu'on suit le cercle de la liberté. Nous ne le savons pas. Et selon, euh, il y a euh, <coughs> des, autres, des autres cas euh, vraiment difficiles. Pour nous, c'est. Euh, on dit et moins rigolo que les autres racistes, mais euh, ce passage que j'ai vu est plutôt bizarre. Euh, un autre élément qui est étroitement euh, lié à la structure de cette œuvre est la possibilité que les séries onomastiques dérivent directement d'un langage classique, d'un auteur, d'un passage de la terre, auteur. C'est-à-dire que l'empreinte le terme présent dans une texte est présent comme élément de la série homonastique. Alors, un instant, dans le matériel qui euh, concerne les <coughs> compétitions, on peut citer ce passage du troisième livre de Poulou. Euh, ici, on parle de la loupe de la décompétition de l'eau. Euh, la, la source est un passage de plus subit. Euh, on peut voir le passage de plus subit. Est le panéron pour une vitesse, lui, par le cas, tout le monde n'a de style et l'aide s'entend. Le loup se transforme ainsi là, le texte. A pour une maïse, à pour une vitesse, c'est de prier, c'est de prier. Pour Nazastai, il y a l'aoriste, parce que l'aoriste indique l'action en soi-même. Alors, dans la lexicographie, dans Pollux, dans ce texte, il est plus probable que l'infinitif soit à l'aoriste la, que au présent, parce que l'aoriste, en grec, en détention, indique l'action en soi-même. Gugnage sta in paracolus. A pregugnage sta in colus. Eh, paracolus. Eh, paracolus. Eh, on commence. Commence avec le terme qui commence par gugn. Gugnage sta in gugnosis, gugnasio, totorin. Qui il y a un verbe qui si dit. Lipa alex sta. Se lui è. Et là, il prise à ça. Et en plus vite, il y a l'IPA et l'AIPSA. Et là, l'IPA et l'AIPSA. Et là, il y a une prise à ça qui est une expression plus jouée, plus une autre expression pour dire l'IPA et l'AIPSA. On peut voir. Il y a euh, la choléographie de Thucydide où il y a l'IPA 
Homeros e Pitetacos, lei e Toelani. Non ne sa voi fare, sì, eh, la scoreografia più si dite e te la, uh, la source de Polus. Probabilmente il mio è un commentario di Fusidi che ha detto che qui a Polus. Polus non è il eh, passaggio di Fusidi. Polus è la source. Allora non è il passaggio di Fusidi che trasforma in eh, situazione onomastica e dentro il termine onomastica e inserire eh, une explication qu'il y avait dans le commentaire. Probablement. Euh, tout ça pour montrer qu'il y avait des, des, des problèmes et que le texte de Pollux est différent et particulier. Il y a beaucoup d'éléments dans Pollux que euh, l'on doit comprendre. Euh, en partant de son critère, de son euh, de, de, de ses critères de, 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 de travail. Euh, ici, je passe de là, de là, à la, à la, à la deuxième partie. Euh, un autre élément très important de l'œuvre de Paul Rousseau est qu'il y a une attitude, une mentalité descriptive. Euh, nous sommes dans l'âge des communs, dans le deuxième siècle. Euh, et il y a surtout, dans ce moment de la culture grecque, une mentalité prescriptive. Mais Poulouc est un, un cœur, la même euh, mentalité descriptive qu'il y avait dans la création de l'Église. Nous pouvons remarquer un euh, Aristophane de Byzance, par exemple. Ce est très important pour comprendre le deuxième livre. Le deuxième livre est formé par des gens nomastiques qui étaient copiés. Et quels sont ces gens-mastiques Les gens-mastiques qui parlaient des monnaies ou qui parlaient des jeux. Ce passage parle du jeu des dés. Et euh, je voudrais parler de trois éléments. Il y a beaucoup de problèmes. Il y a beaucoup de problèmes, mais je voudrais montrer euh, trois éléments, trois éléments surtout les euh, Le premier, c'est le terme d'où le luxe parle. C'est tout le Il faut chercher les dés. Mais, mais pas seulement les dés. Il y a une action mécanique unique et alors, c'est qui même euh, on sait pas ce mail, on aucune possède la main. Le sein, euh, ce qu'il y a, euh, la traduire, je pourrais dire, ce qui est écrit sur le, euh, sur le dé, sur la part de dé, pour montrer la valeur de la, de la, du coup. Pour de l'eau, ton, ton arrêtement, ton bétain. La, la valeur. Et puis, alors, il y a ici une autre valeur, le cubus, et surtout un passage de type métonymique. Mais il y a un autre passage, Marista et Monas. Monas, qu'est-ce que c'est Monas Monas, vous allez, Monas. Hein? Un, 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 deux, allez dans le, le texte, le, le dictionnaire de l'UNESCOP, un, trouve, que ça signifie, donc, un, ou, un, qu'est-ce que c'est, 
Donc, ben, nous achetons un peu un poste étrange. Quand euh, euh, le livre d'Estat cite ce passage, il que ça signifie, ça signifie ex. Qu'est-ce que c'est ex? Nous, 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 nous savons tout. Quand il y a le tennis, ex, la, la science singulaire, la, le couple qui gagne ce, ce moment, la bolle ou la tennis. Mais, alors, si c'est le premier, si c'est le premier, ex, disons que c'est ce que suit. Il y a, on parle du mot de ce monde, il y a un exemple par un héroïque, un proverbe, qui démontre, qui est l'exemple de, euh, qui montre le signifié de Kubus comme menace. Alors, nous, euh, ces signifiés, ces signifiés, euh, il y a ici, il y a un de, de beaucoup de proverbes qui dérivent des jeux de dés. Euh, ici, je vais montrer, euh, surtout dans votre handout, euh, et entre deux, par exemple, le programme du jeu qui dérive du jeu de dés. Euh, un qui est très fameux parce que c'est au commencement de la dernière de la Russie. Il y a le soldat qui est très heureux parce qu'il a euh, finalement vu la lumière qu'il attendait de, depuis longtemps. Et alors, euh, il dit très heureux que. C'est une lumière, c'est comme euh, un, un coup de lait qui est très sexe. Trois fois, fois six. Un autre, un autre proverbe dit que Aïe, Pif, tout jeune, Oï, Dios, Cubo. Les dés de Zeus, les dés de Dio, euh, sont, sont, sont toujours euh, les dés qui donnent le maximum, qui gagnent à elle et Et ici, il y a un de ces problèmes. Qu'est-ce que signifie être sexe et très cool Ça pourrait signifier si nous, nous arrêtons à peu luxe, tristesse, le maximum, triste, couvrir, pour résilier, même le maximum. Il y a des types de qui disent euh, en italien, c'est mon équipe en variant, nous dire la même chose. Mais ce n'est pas vrai. Il y a ici une longue tradition, une tradition euh, paléographique. J'ai et très seulement ici, ce passage des énormes qui ont une carte, je ne l'ai pas mis dans la, la nappe, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de passages. Et alors, j'aimerais, je, je devais faire un nappe de 4 ou 5 passages. Mais, il y a euh, ici une tradition paléographique dans la paléographie. Dans la récipographie, il y a euh, là, euh, une partie de l'exécutographie, la lexicon des postes et autres lexicas qui prennent une, une source paléographique ici. Il y a même l'escolier de la loi de Platon qui nous donne le, juste les, les signifiés en partant d'un texte littéraire. Un texte qui est là. Qu'est-ce que c'est signifie A, ah, le même signifié, que l'italien, nous avons pour l'expression « o la va, o la spacca euh, ». Ça signifie que euh, O, l'on gagne ou l'on perd. Parce que le sexe est la sur du la pas sur. Mais s'il y a 13 coups, on perd sûrement. Alors, coups, menace, un, c'est 
Mais nous, nous, nous. Et si nous prenons ce signifier, ce signifier, le signifier 1, alors, euh, il y a trois D, trois SpaceX, trois fois 6, trois fois 1. S'il y a ce signifier, nous comprenons bien ce qui vient après dans le texte de Coluche. Mais pour comprendre ça, mais pour comprendre ça, nous ne pouvons pas nous arrêter à Coluche. Nous devons faire toute cette euh, investigation, toute cette recherche dans la tradition érudite. Nous ne pouvons jamais nous arrêter à un de ces textes. Parce que nous pouvons nous tromper. Alors nous pouvons comprendre même ce qu'il dit euh, dans la partie souvent où il y a une mise sur euh, chaque euh, point et à la fin il y a euh, une combinaison des monarques, des plaques comme monarques, là qui gagne, qui fait nous la, la, la majorité des points. Mais, je voudrais, euh, j'ai, euh, il y a encore ce qui nous, alors, il y a encore ce qui nous, je voudrais compléter mon, mon, mon intervention euh, par un autre cas qui est très intéressant. Ceci, l'aïstopolitique. Qu'est-ce que c'est l'aïstopolitique C'est un type de jeu. Mais nous n'avons seulement pas de luxe cette fois. Nous pouvons comprendre ce que peut signifier l'aïstopolitique. Plusieurs coups de tête. Mais il y a même la lexicographie. Mais en ce cas, la lexicographie, euh, une psychographie, il y a cette tradition de lexicographie, exige pour tout ça. Euh, sont une tradition, dans une tradition euh, qui l'on l'appelle de la synagogie. Synagogie, c'est très important, mais vous le voyez, il y a, il y a la cause, nous ne comprenons rien. Nous pouvons comprendre seulement une chose. Et c'est un terme adiciste, mais on se finisse, euh, on se mince, euh, c'est possible, ça signifie que même dans le, le monde byzantin, on, on employait ce terme. Mais nous ne comprenons ce que veut dire vraiment. Alors, il y a heureusement des autres passages de plus. Les premières deux ne signifient qu'il n'y a rien. Parce que dans le premier, nous avons ici qui est un type de jeu. Dans les autres, vous voyez, c'est la situation anomastique, une série anomastique de termes qui euh, aboutissent à une date. Nous ne savons plus. Mais le troisième, c'est très intéressant. Parce qu'il dit que l'estoponine, là, au monde, pour le dire, mais même pour le fait, et signifie, signifie qu'il y a beaucoup préhistoriquement. Il y a la combinaison de valeurs. Alors, il y a plusieurs coupes de lait, coupes de lait à la valeur, et il y a à la fin une combinaison. Je pense que c'est un terme général. Je pense que s'il y a la nécessité d'indiquer ça, par un terme si général, l'instant, on pouvait avoir des jeux avec plusieurs possibilités. Peut-être que les jeux s'accordaient en commencement sur le nombre de, 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 de coups. Okay. Mais je pense que c'est le terme général pour dire une situation 
pour, à la fin, gagner ceux qui avaient la majorité dans une combinaison de langues, une combinaison de tout. Je ne sais pas si mon français, mon italien français, euh, a, 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 a pour peu de comprendre ce que je veux dire, mais euh, l'Est de Bolivie est un terme intéressant qui nous intéresse et qui, selon moi, indique euh, en général pour dire toutes les, possi toutes les possibilités où il y avait euh, cette, cette combinaison. J'ai terminé. Merci. Je n'ai pas étudié ça, alors je ne 
Mais la, la chose la plus étrange, la chose la plus, la plus drôle a été pour les Allemands, les bouddhistes, les ne hein, partaient pas euh, de l'idée euh, tout euh, euh, étrange, tout euh, abstrait de la langue. Mais partaient euh, de tête de grandes photos artistes. Et je pense que c'était un des grands auteurs qui nous pouvait éviter. Je pense que je suis dans un rêve et je ne peux pas me répéter. Mais je pense aussi à Maria qui a fait ce trip spécialement délicieux. Maria et je connaissons les autres depuis plus de 20 ans. En fait, nous allons à ce que je appelle les temps BC, les temps pour les gens. One of the most popular uh, circular games in antiquity seems to be the so-called pop game, Hitler, which enacts a dialogue between one child wearing the pot, who takes the persona of Midas, and others about to kick him, uh, one of whom will play the role of the pot wearing Midas, ensuring circularity. Pollux is on Omasticon, in his ninth book, transmits the poetics of this game, which, similar with other circular uh, children's games, presents a rudimentary yet cryptic dialogue between the players as they rotate their uh, roles. And I have the full text in your handout, at uh, the first page, and also here on the slide. Uh, it's worth going over it a bit. Uh, one is sitting in the middle, is called a pot, while the other is running around, either poke him or scratch him or even hit him. Then, at once, one has the pot on his head, holding it with his left hand, going around in circles, those hitting him or asking, What is the pot doing? And he responds, It boils. Or, Who is around the pot? And he responds, I might. And whoever happens to be in his foot, that one goes around in his grave. Uh, the ninth book of Pollux is on the Mastodon discussing, it focuses on parts of cities, then moves on to buildings, coins, and finally death. So I'm not going to say much because Professor uh, Tozzi and also Professor Alonso uh, yesterday uh, pretty much covered most of uh, what I wanted to say. We all know that it's considered to be an onomasiological uh, work in the sense that the entries are not organized alphabetically, as is usually uh, the case such uh, works, but full of conceptual classification. Several scholars think that the onomasticon is the product of the debate and rivalry between those who favor a rigid linguistic theorism, such as the hyperlattice framework, and those practicing a more relaxed attitude, all which being the representative of the language of them. It is important, though, to, conceptual to contextualize the dictionary as a whole, as it gives us a window to the aesthetics and literary taste that inform most of the examples. As part of his aesthetic thread, Pollux uses a broader spectrum of authors, for example, new comedy, especially Menandre, although deemed inferior to all comedy by the hyper -artists. 
and registered works from other literary dialects, poetic, ironic, theology. This registry also shows us the kind of literary trends and how frequent the information presented and is particularly relevant with regard to the pop minus day, as I like to call it. Point at first glance uh, at simple children songs that must have been popular enough for poets to transmit. This children's game can give us information not only on childhood poetics, but even more on how and why certain mythical figures like figures like Midas, who had a long presence in Greek thinking and literature, became an object of ridicule and death. The name Midas refers to historical king who controlled the large area of central Anatolia until his death at the time of the Kimerian invasion in the 7th century BC. But this Midas associated with Gordon became a character in Greek and Latin literature closely connected to legends of wealth and wisdom or pseudo-wisdom as a man who was captured or captured at Western Cyrenius to learn the meaning of happiness. Although the association with Satyrus makes him a character connected with dramatic performance uh, not in its solemn form but rather the comical aspect to Satyrus drama and comedy. Looking at the complex intertextual associations with dramatic performance and the game poetics as it survived, I think we can also discern interesting intergenerational dialogues. Midas is not an uncommon reference to the on comic stage uh, and is a registered figure in Greek discourse. By looking at the tradition uh, into childhood poetics, we can see both the interaction between the children's and adult genres but also delve into the wider problem of popular reception of comic verses beyond the formalized stage. Like today, when a show from TV or theater can be part of common discourse, this regularity is what happened in the minor stage. A game can be created through words that circulate. As Plato put it, in, uh, it is very easy to make games. In fact, proliferation of games is something that Laponic laws sought to control. Children's songs translate what is both memorable and easily identifiable for their purposes, and this happens in unconscious rather than conscious ways. In other words, we are looking at the heart of oral transmission when we do not have a genius toy or a steering poetic voice. In fact, this is what I like to call base poetics and work. A couple of uh, notes for my methodology. I'm using two different threads. The presence of Midas as a figure in Greek myth and law, and also the comic stage, and the persistent use of pop as theatrical props, creating slapstick humor and laughter in several comic fragments, from both extant comedies, as you know, it's often we see as present for the and so on, and fragments from practice and caramels and demonics, with the explicit purpose to explore the fascinating dialogue around the common themes between children and adult genres of performance. Furthermore, I seek to delve into questions of not only generic interactions, but also ritual and gender inversions and ideologies of other individuals and groups of rich individuals in a seemingly playful form. Ultimately, such lines both mirror and undermine adult performative modes that can also channel ideologies. Let's take the first one. Midas. Midas is known to be the legendary wealthy man with origins from Phrygia, uh, but also as an added layer, the seeker of wisdom. The deep antithesis that is inherent in this figure, uh, and that has not been explained in any convincing way, is that he also appears as a foolish comic figure with donkey's ears, something that seems to be a later development. The earliest reference to Midas is in Titeus, uh, and that's handout number two. It's a rather negative one, as Titeus praising military prowess and saying that unless one excels in war, other qualities need nothing. It dis he disqualifies uh, people who are legendary for certain qualities, such as the secretaries, uh, their strength, speed, and the French and King Korea's beauty for Tigranus, and of course, well for Midas. The donkey's ear first appears as a physical component in the representation, both visual and literary, around the second half of the 5th century, and served and remained part of his identity until the later 
One of the most persuasive explanations of the, of the origin of this tradition could be that the Silenus figure, Midas' interlocutor, is the wisdom seeking uh, dialogue, was conflated with Midas for physical traits of a hybrid creature and his uh, non entirely human characteristic passed from one figure to the other. As Lynn Roller Ro Ro noted, this feature was puzzling to antiquity as well, and several authors suggested Adria for this, the most prevalent being that this was punishment for Midas' unwise decision in preferring the musical quality of the Satyr Marcius over that of the Calda Associating the ears with better hearing, the lithographer Collins proposed that these long pointed to Midas being surrounded by spies or informers. This is a tradition that we also find in a lot of scholia. Plato scholias uh, suggest that the ears of this is either due to the fact that he uses spies around him and or because the donkey is an animal with very astute hearing sets, acoustic color, that's right then number three. The Scholias of Aristophanes, number four, follows the tradition that some relate that Midas was not just Dionysus, uh, was not just towards Dionysus' donkeys, so the god uh, Andrew of that gave him donkey ears. Or that Midas, having insulted Dionysus, he was transformed into donkey. The latter is not very well known, uh, otherwise tradition, and this transformation from Midas, a great king, to donkey is a feature worthy of further scrutiny. Kings and donkeys are, as we shall see, again well registered uh, references to children's games. In fact, yesterday, when we gave us this wonderful uh, tour of, of the museum, there were a lot of donkey and uh, turning uh, uh, the kind of distinction which seems to be a pretty deep kind of association. Athenaeus preserved a story about Midas' ears having been pulled out of shape by a nobleman to indicate his grace to be. Um, this is in no likelihood an attempt to alienate the Phrygian figure, debase him, and present him in common colors. The reference to Midas, also father of the Indiersi, survives in a fragment from Sosipius, that's number five. In, uh, in this most excellent of the fragments by Sosipius, we have a second fragment that although produced in the 3rd century BCE, it seeks to restore the style of the 5th century BC underground. In this one, the Bucolic story of Daphnis is interwoven with that of the legendary reaper Gersis, uh, who is reportedly the illegitimate son of Midas, who had taken Fabia Daphnis' leave as his wife. He asked to compete in weeping with anyone who came near and in the end cut their head with his sickle. Heracles appeared as a Deus Ex Machina and reunited the people that would be there. Maybe more games in there who can talk about it at that time. Midas is often represented as a comic figure with donkey ears and, of course, not the greatest intelligence. The stories could very well be compatible with the pot game. One can even say a pot is worn to cover the ears, and as the pot brings attention to the head of the central figure, forms it. The famous account of how King Minus captured the Sabius Aeneus in order to make him reveal what is best for man is also found in Aristotle, Fragment 44. This paradoxical reply, never to be born, and if born to die as soon as possible, explains why the passage is so regularly cited in studies of pessimism in ancient Greek culture. The other well known story of Midas and that of the Holy Touch. Um, is, of course, um, we have the earliest known reference to it in uh, the politics of Aristotle, when he writes that a man could be amply supplied with money and yet die of hunger, which is exactly what happened to Midas, for the insatiable desire of his prayer caused everything which was placed before him to become bold as we know. The legendary wealth does not seem to be part of the early tradition, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was not known earlier or that stories like that did not circulate a more broadly. Immense wealth that can still end in hunger is part of the association with this figure. The cure to hunger is food, and cooking food is perhaps the most important activity of the day that ensures survival. There is practically no household that does not have a basic apparatus, some cooking foods, 
and most important of all. The notion of hunger and the pot as a source of the material remedy for hunger can also be found to be part of the same associations that can lead to mythical law and practices. Although it is impossible to argue with any certainty with that, uh, whether storytelling about Midas and its connections with the hunger motif, the game as it stands offers the synchronicity of possible clues that can be linked to each other. Hunger, and we heard a lot about uh, some of the uh, ancient texts from Marco uh, two days ago that I should discuss this in two days, so I'm skip a little bit here, um, has uh, a deep connection with the very inventions of game. And I think Marco has covered me when we talk about Palamides, who is thought to be the inventor of dice, who saved the archive army while it was ready to allow this before the expedition to Troy. And uh, we have, of course, the famous Sophocles and Franklin Nautilus, Pesus, Tibus, Death, and non ideas artists. Hunger, hunger can also be an aspect of insatiability, which is also a great when connected to men's work, and can arguably lie behind this type of thought. Moreover, if we take further the Midas figure with its possible associations as the core of the, what I call historiola, then the children's game offers, as historiolas do, the summarized reference reduced in a song which seemingly without much meaning beyond the art of play itself, yet it affords us, despite the fragmentary references, with a luxury to delve further into ancient poetic tradition. As mentioned already, Midas was depicted with Don ears quite a bit. The earliest reference to Don uh, in the Greek literature is the simile in Iliad, which describes a Don who defined the efforts of his overseers. But Midas is only partly Don and in that with respect to the ears. This hybridity between Don and human form is one that has a long presence in Greek and Roman literature culminating in what must have been Lucian's novels or Lucian's of the Asp, which of course must, uh, was at the core of Apollinarius's masterpiece of the Golden Axe. For the latter, among the many scholars who look at the interpretive possibilities for Apollinarius's novel, Kenny has astutely suggested that the Asp's ears symbolize its ability to listen without full understanding. Something that points to those who lack the wisdom do listen without deeper comprehension of what they hear. This offers a different layer of the philosophical understanding. And given that the Silenus figure is featured in philosophical texts associated with Socrates in the end of Plato, despite the absence of reference to the Dodgers ears of the game, we can see that this, this set of Midas representation can give us more clues about the process of adoring for the future game. A philosophical position on hearing and understanding, one of the most dominant themes in philosophy, can lurk behind the Midas' usual representation of comic stage. Bending Gower's remarks that the figure of the ass uh, and the ass's ears is used in Latin literature to make the same point. Everyone has ass's ears until they see the light of philosophy. Others following the tradition of animal metaphors for ethical use, you see the donkey as a figure of servile behavior, which is also linked to the base curiosity of someone who listens but doesn't take in deeper what the long ears do. If Midas can be seen as someone who comes from far away and is interested in learning the six philosophical theoria, then the caricature of Dante's ears is nothing less than what Silvio Modiglio has called the unphilosophical theoria, one that emphasizes hearing, perhaps with the wrong interlocutor, but not through knowledge. Midas has an epistemological problem, and his transformation to a comic figure further reveals that. Midas is a king, and games often present kings as characters that appear as kings, often to be equated with the winners of some sort of uh, ball games like the Fininda, uh, that's handout number six. Um, and then a source contemporary to Polish, no other than the Greek work by Suetonius on games of the Greeks, connects the king and donkey themes. In this passage, Suetonius gives different types of ball games, such as the Aboraxis, also found in Polish and Eustatius, which involves basketball kind of kicking or the ball on the ground, or the Episcus, which is a kind of rugby-like game, where they hit the ball into a kind of a chipping of stone, a Latikinos, 
and then they start chasing the ball. The farinita is a different kind of game when they show the ball and then send it off to others. Now for this game, those that win are the teams, those that lose are the dominants. Uh, this is not a new reference to winners and losers of games. It's something that goes back to at least the latest fear titles that's come down number seven, when Socrates uses a simile when discussing wisdom and knowledge. I understand that the connection between wisdom seeking figure of Midas and the king behind Plato's tribute games that assimilates those who can achieve knowledge and wisdom as kings is a tenuous connection. Nevertheless, the Midas game is a very physical and unlike other game, not only requires human action, this has the added reference to the pot, which presumably one side wore as it was going from head to head. Both the lyrics and the performance highlight a certain materiality, placing emphasis on not just any figure, but in particular the void of uh, pot. A simple association of the heat of the game and the heat of the pot and the notion of action and running around makes this type of imagery even more sort of convincing as the passage from house or to the game. The pot was one of the most common object props for a public stage. As Wetterman notes, props on stage are considered visual narratives, filled with symbolic connotations and stories to tell. With a view from semiotics and psychoanalysis, Wetterman admits that props are detachable, with a durable impression ability, very different to that of words or gestures, but are not easily decoded. They can be iconic and symbolic, but function at the same time as mobile signs. More prolific in comedy than tragedy, their use is often geared to audiences with shorter span of attention, expecting the last for an action. Tordo furthermore uh, writes, and I quote, comedy abounds and rejoices in these humble things. Unlike tragedy, where we don't see them in the same way. In theatre, we have a relationship between physical object and plot, as objects can create subspace and can give nuances of specific modality, creating ritual or meta theatrical references. In his study on, uh, on the kinds of plots in dramatic stage, Tordoff has shown that when considering different categories, such as clothes, furniture, tools, etc., items that relate to food and drink and their containers are by far the most represented in Aristophanes' nights, but domestic items like that are sparser in later Aristophanes. Menander and the new comedy uses props in similar terms with domestic items are being ubiquitous. But the game is not theater per se. Yet in games, as in theater, everyday objects are stripped from their practical use to become drinkers of jokes games and laughter often with lasted few. The point is thought of as having hundreds that can with all ears as seen in half of number eight, with complex references as a what can be a type of exist when you also grab someone by the ears. Why in this particular fragment by Eugolis, the only one that survives with this particular comic point, we have no idea what is happening other than it probably refers to Adelia, a copies are also mentioned by most of these uh, the reference to ears and the pot is quite intriguing. Uh, this fragment survives in the tenth book of poems, which also makes it more intriguing. So we have many references to the pot in practice, one in the Samias, Samion, and it's mentioned three times in Eupolis, once in the fragments of Heraclitus, in the Picarmus, several in Aristophanes that are not uh, included here. And likewise, in, pro in uh, fragments from new comedy, it's featured in Timotheus, Alexandridis, and Tiffany's and others. A picker must have the title Hydra. In fact, Tony Bill, uh, two days ago, when we were talking about this, reminded me about the, 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 the notion of cause in the Antistadium. Of course, we had the wonderful uh, presentation by Vicky and more details about it. So the ritual aspect is something that hasn't explored in that certainly part of daily life. The pot is also an object that is used for tea, like the comic shield, which can break and empty all its comments, as in an anecdote for zero, zero the story, that's kind of number nine. Now, to weave all these threads together, the children are creating a game that uses a character who is memory, flexible as a figure in comic poetics, 
and the addition of donkey ears and wealth anecdotes in the background of the stories that circulate very vividly in people's minds, and marry that with the most common item in any household, a cooking pot. The work theme is very common in children's songs and games worldwide. The other girls' tag game, the tortoise game, also presents the theme of weaving, connecting women's work and lament as the girls go around the figure of the tortoise. But while in most cases we have a typified figure, here we have a specific reference to a historical figure, Midas, but a Midas that has become a legend and a comical figure. The association with notions of wealth, from wisdom, degrading, stupidity, and wealth that yet is not free from hunger, can be seen as elements that channel less so philosophical elements, although arguably that happens too through this game, but even more can navigate polarities and deconstruct symbols of wealth. Would children be familiar with Midas and Comic Stage? If not directly, certainly in lore and circulating legends, enough to release creativity and through this proliferation create what seems to have been a popular song and game that can also become a way to philosophize innocently. Understand that life is not uh, 
see the floaties, and the jobs are just supposedly posing gay, you know. <laughs> a lot of, so, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of uh, work being done about children's games or songs. Uh, this is a game, but others are just songs, where uh, the references are very gloomy. So, what are they doing psychologically? Do they negotiate trauma? Do they negotiate uh, a kind of a collective trauma? There's many theories, but they do negotiate uh, psychological processes in, in sort of what seems naive, but it's not. It's a, it's a deeper uh, element there. So, this is, this is different than I guess. I mean, I'm still trying to work out some things. Uh, because also when somebody is ridiculed, that can also have all kinds of other associations of what that means. Um, possibly also channels as kind of weaker users in a way, kind of mentality. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask you if leaders is uh, also a good symbol of otherness and uh, whether figures of otherness are important in the games and whether we <coughs> apply to them a ritualistic function of the idea and to me as iconography also is uh, not alone as being other, but also the Persians, it's racial, right. it's right. interesting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's also an excellent point. Um, I, I absolutely think that Midas is a kind of a, a magnet, let's say, of negative connotations and ridicule. And can function in a way, in ways that you have a kind of a, a scapegoat figure, so to speak. But while in ritual you can have a scapegoat figure, in a game, this kind of, um, it's, it's softened, say, because everybody, this is the beauty of the game, going back to the psychological process, because everybody becomes a mind. So the other, and that's why I said you, that ideologies are challenged, but they're also at the same time undermined, and this is precisely because everybody becomes a so there is more in the, in, the, in the processes that go around in the game. That's why part of me thinks that those games actually don't easily channel, let's say, the, the algorithm that you may see in tragedy. Because of, you know, everybody does. So is the game becoming other? It separates the group? And then becoming part of the group again. But in my desk, it's because you, you become the magnet who receives all the, and also the city. So this is actually even more interesting because it's not, I mean, the thought to get, the thought is easier, so to speak. But the my desk, I mean, the thought is, uh, it's more violent. You know? So it is also the game of change of identity. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So on one hand, you can say, yes, the other is there, but by having everyone go through this other, then going back to the Salvatore said about instruction, it's an interesting social process, which I think is a kind it's almost like a resistance to, to, to what happens. I mean, I'm good more as I think it's a kind of sort of but yeah. I have some uh, the question about the first day of politics. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, it's not living, um, describing two games, mm. not one. Yeah. So the first one would be a static one. Yes, yes. So the person in the yeah. middle yeah. with name that uh, uh, kutra, mm -hmm. but without any real kutra. Mm -hmm. And so the, the children around are uh, running, right. and maybe there is a form in you. Is passive tense. Yes, absolutely. So um, the man with coat uh, by the one who is uh, uh, in the middle of people running around, right, right. but is passive. And then 
the, we have the end of the game because so the second one was code mm -hmm. uh, take the, the place of the uh, and so that's the end as at the end of the passage it's also the end because one is replacing the other and then as to team sometimes, sometimes we have another game and the other game is with a real uh, uh, code and <coughs> so is is uh, running in this case so the keyboard protagonist is, is running and um, the people are asking this baby who is with the code not, not, not in or uh, uh, around is not around is handing with the so left hand and then the answer a or the answer all the events and then who done to get the pointer and who done to the uh, to put me uh, I was wondering did he not do it whoever happens to be this fruit uh, the one who is uh, touching reaching uh, with the food either because so it's this yeah. food on with the the food if the cover of the food I don't know could uh, apples uh, that exist and maybe it's, it's uh, um, something uh, uh, related so to the not to the history yeah. but to the food of the cover. So there's some no, I actually real think that maybe Salvatore will be translated as uh, the clue for this. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think you're right. It's one of the very few cases where Poland is doing is giving us a compact version. And this compact version essentially could be three, I mean, it could be the same game, more or less, in three different uh, ways. The one without any lyrics, which you know, it can happen, it's not a necessary component. And then two versions with two different kinds of lyrics. And, and that can also, as you rightly say, uh, can create kind of variations in the gesture, the movement. So uh, I agree with you that there is a, this needs more advising, uh, that there is, there is more, it's a compact sort of version that you put together, which I think I kind of look at very uh, sort of shadowy. Um, I think what is what's happening is uh, it really shows that we talk to you in a very, very, I mean, it's also easy. I mean, everybody has a thought, so it's extremely easy. You don't need anything special, and then you can have the particular and the minus reference can be different ways, or even without minus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 C'est pas intéressant, je pense qu'on peut revenir sur l'image, pas vraiment la suivante. La suivante, on peut. Voilà, celle-ci. Nous sommes allés juste parfaitement, justement, ce changement. Avec un Midas, avec ses oreilles d'âme, qui porte le prétendu du sartre, qui lui est bien rapide. Et la rénale se trouve à côté de Midas, alors qu'un personnage de sartre se trouve à côté de sartre. Il y a une illustration parfaite ici, ce changement de il a dû jouer euh, la transformation du personnage dans le monde qui comme ça. Oui, comme si ça. Et ça, So would you say that in, in a way this is the quintessential future of ancient comedy that's going on that play in a way function, functions like that and comedy does that what in a play uh, is, is, is basically uh, uh, done. And in, in a way this future play also has a certain dimension also is good use for us dancing yes, around and there's a person and, and uh, it's, it's changed out etc. 
and and then we have this uh, line that, uh, as you also say, for example, in, in Pintos, uh, where you have this little scene and people don't know what to do with that yes. and so on. And in a way, it's it's the essence of of Hollywood. Yeah, and no, thank you for this. Uh, if you're right, Hollywood, that you're not just speaking, it's probably it's everywhere. That's the mm -hmm. way it works. And of course, we study, it's a, you make me think how you study children's games, because the sources are so later, you kind of place them later in the chronology, later in the frame of them. That doesn't mean to work there. I think the topics game we know for a fact that they were much earlier. So it's very possible that something like that, or a simple uh, learning kind of pot, uh, without even the Michael's reference or something like that, a kind of particular sort of Maybe be part of what we say that kind of shaped the genre of drama to begin with. It's a completely different perspective. Because if our sources are based on the universe, we kind of treat them as, as a matter of what we I mean, after all, the particular source came to be, so we very interesting, we should be very well to be one. So there's more interaction there. So it's, these are the analogies. This is that when it gets to Tapa and you are going to be sick. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you very much.